Greetings, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, here uh, with uh, on the pastor's panel, as we're calling it. This is our second one. The first one we did was prompted by our desire to do something for the men of our church related to our Iron Men ministry. So uh, it actually was an, an Iron Men's panel, and uh, we were going to do a second one and do part two and continue that discussion related to our Iron Men ministry. And we decided to, um, to broaden this. This is not actually specifically for the men of our church. We're, we're doing something today that is for all of our church outside our Irons Men, Iron Men ministry, including our Iron Men, but the ladies as well, the teens and so forth. It's an important topic that uh, I felt like I just really wanted to say some things. I wanted to get some key people to be a part of this panel. I was thinking through various pastors that would be uh, excellent choices to have on a panel like this, and I made that list of the three I wanted, and lo and behold, I realized they were all three part of our church here, already on staff, so that was very Amen. convenient. It worked out <laughs> that uh, you guys were all here. didn't cost me any money extra to get you in and all that kind of stuff. You chose Kyle over Sinclair Ferguson? Yes, I did. We, I chose you, you three over a long list of, of wow. very uh, notable people, so I appreciate your so willingness to be a part. Now, I wanted to talk about some things uh, as a pastor here, and we as pastors for our people, maybe people outside our congregation as well, they end up watching this, about what our responses ought to be, what our thinking ought to be related to all that's going on right now in our world with this pandemic, the, the COVID-19 virus, and <clears throat> how do we view all that, and especially uh, how we are to relate to the government restrictions that are being put upon us, how does our church respond to that, how should we respond, uh, uh, so on and so forth. So, uh, yeah, I think it's an important uh, topic, and hopefully we'll be able to, to share some things that will uh, you know, help all of us uh, think biblically about all, all this. At the end of the day, it's what we want, is to think and live in a way that, that pleases God. So I trust that uh, the end result will be that. But just to kick us off, I was thinking about just what this time in our history has, has prompted uh, around the world. I mean, there's been, there's been some... Some, some good things and some bad things, you know, on the, uh, the, the bad side, it, it seems like pressure like this stirs up a lot of, a lot of hatred, you know, people uh, saying uh, ugly and hateful things toward other people and the tension between views and all that kind of stuff, that becomes apparent. And uh, that's uh, sad. It just kind of reminds us something about human nature, I guess, that we are all born... Uh, uh, lost and depraved and fallen, and even when we come to Christ, we still have the flesh that we battle. And uh, but anyway, that's an interesting thing uh, that's happened. But on the positive side, uh, whether you're saved or lost, there's been a. It seems like a, an increased awareness of the of the value of of relationship, you know, with other people. Have you guys noticed that or, or thought about that at all? Why, why do you think that's true, even for lost people? Yeah, I mean, obviously wisdom has it, even Solomon has declared that uh, when death and mortality is thrust before us, we start thinking about the deeper things of life and things that maybe matter more than uh, others, other um, trivialities or superficial things that we might pursue. So it doesn't surprise me that, that that's happened, even at, at even for unbelievers, and it's a grace from the Lord. I think. Yeah, so thinking about uh, eternal things, either, even if they don't define it that way or call it that, yeah. that's what they're doing, and maybe they don't even know that's what they're, they're laboring over. Uh, something about the vertical there. But uh, even in the horizontal realm, uh, yeah. what do you see happening among, among people, you know, on the good side, let's say? Yeah, it seems there's... Um a realization and a longing the longer that this goes um, for people to be together in person, you know, that people are more and more realizing the value and the importance of real relationships, not just virtually, not just on social media, but face to face with one another. Some of that even stems, you know, first and foremost, in the way that we're made, we're made for relationship first and foremost with God, our creator, but then even with other humans. And, 
you know, maybe in recent years as technology has exploded, we've forgotten that we've, mm -hmm. you know, we've grown accustomed to texting and, you know, our, our social media feed, but suddenly we're seeing it's, it's a helpful tool, but it, it's a cheap substitute to the real thing. Yeah. And right now we're, we're starved for that real thing. Yeah. So even, that's true of even unbelievers, uh, theologically, uh, we believe that man is made in the image of God. So that's, that, that's one of the theological, uh, you know, foundational reasons for this happening amongst people. Again, unbelievers don't think that way. You know, I'm, I'm made in the image of God, and I want to express that by being with other people, you know. Which, which reflects, as was already touched on a little bit, but the, the relational nature of our God. Yeah. The, the, the triunity of our God. There is an eternal relationship amongst the persons of the Godhead. Once again, when we were created, as we, we have a way for us to express that image, and that is through relationship, like we said, with God himself and horizontally with other humans. And that fellowship is always spoken of, the intimacy of it, in the scriptures as face to face and in the presence of, mm -hmm. you know, um, which is what we long for. Now, now, this is true of all people, what we're talking about, the, the need and desire for a relationship. But uh, you can take that a step further, even with, with believers then. There's even an extra desire. What, what is that desire uh, that's within us when it comes to believers and, and our fellowship with one another? Why, why do we want that? What's the purpose of it? To gather, to be together, um, to fulfill the one another's, yeah, to, to be encouraged, yeah, yeah. We we feel that responsibility, that need, to minister to one another, you know, and to live out the one another's uh, in, a, in a community, a family of believers, and to worship corporately as well. We have that <clears throat> that compulsion, you know, within us. God puts that within us. So here we are, human beings wanting to be with other human beings. But I see that in my neighborhood when I walk around, people out in their yards, you know, and even though they're standing uh, yesterday, there was one lady on one side of the street in her driveway, a lady on the other side of the street in her driveway, just fellowshipping, you know, talking. And my grandson and I rode our bicycles between them, you know, and it was, it was, it was kind of cool to say hi, you know, and I don't hardly know them. You know? And some passage, one passage at least that tends to uh, just kind of wrap all that up would be like the Ephesians 5, 18 and 19 passage where commanded to be filled with the Spirit. That is a unique gift to those who are in Christ. And the result of that filling of the Spirit, one of those things is the gathering and in particular even the singing to one another. And so the, the one of the not only the benefits of being filled with the Spirit, but the results of it is this desire to gather and to encourage and admonish one another in song. Yeah, I've been really encouraged as I've heard that from people. You know, people saying that through text and emails and phone calls and <clears throat> and so forth, and the little few interactions that we've been able to have along the way of of just how much we long for that. Especially in the Zoom calls. You know, we've been doing all these Zoom calls our small groups meeting together via Zoom and so forth. And, and that said, every once in a while, well, we sure, we love this technology, but we sure long to be together, to worship together, to sing together, to encourage together. That brings up a question, though, on the part of, of many. Okay, that, that's the way we're made. That's what God desires of us. We have that obligation. And Scripture even makes it very clear in Hebrews chapter 10 that we are not to be forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And so that question is being asked by some. Okay, well, are, aren't, we, aren't we doing that? Or are we doing that? Should we be concerned about uh, that command from the Lord, that expectation from the Lord? And uh, is there a place for saying, you know what, that's, that, that's a higher priority than some of these other responsibilities that we're, we're sensing from our government and so forth. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, so let, let's, let's turn our attention to that. That's Hebrews 10. 25, I've received questions about this, and I've heard from other pastors that they have received questions from people uh, about the same thing. What about this verse, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together? So, uh, uh, Kevin, maybe you can read that for us. It's, uh, just for go back to verse 23. Read 23, 24, and 25 of Hebrews 10. Yeah, let us hold fast the confession of our hope 
without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we have a mix of things in those verses, and if we had read a few verses before that, <clears throat> we see that mix continue of these uh, expectations God has of us has uh, of us individually in our own walk with the Lord and our relationship to Him and drawing near to Him and in our relationship to the world, you know, holding fast our testimony and the confession of our hope that's in Christ. And we sense that obligation from the Lord. And then it goes back to, to some of this corporate stuff of stimulating one another to love and good deeds. That's what we were talking about earlier, really, about the relationship uh, obligation that we have in the body of Christ. And with that understood, then there's a little bit of a, of a negative uh, side to that. You know, that means that we've got to be together to do that, to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. We can certainly do it through texting and email, and, but nothing will ever replace that intimate sort of being together in each other's presence. And so we can't be guilty of forsaking our own assembly together, as is the habit of some. So it is presenting that when this was written, that there were some people potentially being put into this category of violating this. Um, and so we need to talk about that for a moment because I think it's important that we clear up some confusion here about what this verse means and what it does not mean. So contextually, um, th this, is, this is speaking to individuals something about their own Hearts. What what do, you, what do you think the real concern is about a person's heart here that's expressed in this verse? I think first off, it's a it's it's a deliberate mm -hmm. choice in the heart of an individual to neglect the regular gathering. And even in verse twenty six, in in kind of summing it up, for if we go on sinning deliberately, and so it's someone who is in sin because they are making a conscious choice individually to neglect they do the not gathering. want to be together right <clears throat> it's willful yeah. yeah very willful very strong there is not in the heart any desire to be with other believers yeah yeah the, the, this is talking about the people that have the opportunity together and they're choosing not to do it as individuals uh, and you know in that culture uh, there were certain reasons why some of these people would choose to stop gathering. Of course, they didn't have the kind of church buildings and things that we're aware of today. Many of these towns, uh, there were small cells or, or meeting in, in a home, a small group of believers, the minority of people and so forth. What, what was one of the things that uh, they were certainly concerned about in their time when they would gather together in, in a public way like this? What was one of the threats that they dealt with? I mean, persecution was yeah. a very real threat. Um, and all throughout Hebrews, you know, for some, apparently there was this this question and this temptation. Is it worth it? You know, have I made this right choice with pursuing Christianity? Or should I retreat? Should I go back to Judaism? You know, and, and with that, this concern that maybe in the hearts of some of the people there is this heart of unbelief perhaps here manifested that there's really no desire no longing to be with other believers yeah believe it or not even as much uh, uh, as it's been true that that the jews have been persecuted uh, for their faith by the rest of the world <clears throat> um, in this time there was a relative safety in Judaism that did not exist in Christianity. So there was this pull by some as they faced potential persecution. Hebrews has already talked about the loss of their property, uh, imprisonment, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, there was a relative safety to go back uh, to Judaism from whence they, they came. And so, yeah, that, that's what's being addressed here, that all of a sudden some people are not showing up anymore. They're not coming around. And so the question is being being asked on the part of faithful believers, what's going on with these individuals? That one individual, they don't want to be a part of the assembly. You know, what's going on? 
Well, so it is a willful thing. It was a personal, individual choice, something wrong in their own heart. They weren't really committed to Christ. And that's why if you keep reading this passage, starting at verse 26, it starts talking in some very strong terms about judgment. And you keep going and you realize, well, what's being talked about here is apostasy. The idea of making a profession of faith in Christ and love for Christ and then abandoning that. This is not the only portion of Scripture that, that addresses apostasy, but it's the idea of abandoning your relationship with Christ for something else. And Hebrews elsewhere even says that's, that's a dangerous thing because the true apostate uh, never comes back again. So you, you can understand the concern on the part of, of the true believers at that time when they're looking at some of these individuals not coming to the corporate worship time, as small as it was, perhaps, uh, it could represent apostasy. And that was a great, great concern. So is, is that what's going on today? Is, is that why we're not meeting I know, Sundays, that's, I, I, I mean, I know that's a question in a lot of people's minds. I mean, uh, it certainly has uh, run through my mind at times. And I, th I think in the past, apart from studying the context, it's it's easy to drop into this and pull out verse 25 and even use it um, sort of in a, um, in, in a proof text kind of way. And I think sometimes rightly so in our intent, in intention to uh, emphasize the importance of the corporate gathering of God's people, uh, no doubt. But I mean, you 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 uh, you studied through, you preached through Hebrews, uh, the whole book of Hebrews. Uh, maybe you can help us carry. Is I mean, w discern between. Well, is this a command that I can never miss church? Um, am I am I disobeying this? You know. When I go on a family vacation and I yeah, miss a question. Sunday, um, I mean, I've thought that. What, yeah. How would you? How yeah, would you I, I've heard it taught that. How way. would you answer? You know, in a real legalistic kind of environment, yeah. you know, a controlling environment, man, there's a there's a church, uh, there's a sort of a church Gestapo or something that's looking out for people. <laughs> Where were you? What were you doing? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, you could you could say, well, does this apply to the person that uh, uh, they were sick? I mean, you know, okay, you know, I understand you don't feel good, you're sick, but, you know, the Bible says don't forsake the assembly, you know, <laughs> you're an apostate, or you go on vacation, or a business trip, perhaps, yeah. you're traveling, you're, you're called out of town. Yeah. A lot of those things come up. I think you challenged, I think even as we had discussed earlier this week, even, I think you, you even challenged my thinking on this, uh, pushing, pushing me back into the context, and as you guys were talking, just thinking through, you know, the spa ladies just finished you know, the hermeneutics study, how to study the Bible. I mean, that context is so critical. And even as I was just reading it, as you guys were talking, the two main commands at verse 23, 24, you know, on which verse 25 is kind of hinged and attached to as a somewhat of a subordinate uh, clause. The two main commands are let us hold fast and let us consider. And then, and, and then this, um, verse 25 so it's almost as though this forsaking is it flows out of um, these two things as perhaps mm -hmm. even a reflection of um, holding fast to the faith and a, and and a, and a and a mindset that is towards um, encouraging one another yeah and so I think that that that's helpful to me but yeah. Um, well, we've, we've certainly wanted to be careful through the years, and, and I'm just speaking as, as a pastor myself through the years, to, to grow in this understanding that as much as I, I, I want people there every Sunday, you know, you, you got to be careful with this mindset that I kind of heard growing up, you know, you need to be at church every time the doors are open. You know, that's sort of that extreme view. Anything less than that is you're forsaking the assembly. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just sort of pulling this out of context and using it to control people and intimidate people. So, yeah, we, 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 don't, we don't need to say anything about uh, someone who's their pattern of their life is they come. Of course they want to be there. But now something has happened. They're drawn away on business or a vacation or 
uh, and it's just not, they're not able to gather where they are or they're sick, you know, so many things can come up like that. So <clears throat> we know those people whose hearts are right, which is at, at the end of the day, that's the issue. Their heart desires to be with God's people. As soon as that season or that Sunday or that trip is over or whatever, what do we know about those people? Well, they'll be back. Yeah. They'll be back to worship again. That, that's their heart's longing, of course. So what's going on right now? I mean, I, I'm not... Certainly, there can be some people right now, okay, no doubt, that the government restrictions and the things that we're agreeing to abide by as a church... There could be someone going, yes, this gives me the excuse. I get to stay home. I can just wear my pajamas all day and not go to church. You know, I don't even need to watch the live stream. They'll never know whether I do or not. Of course that could be going on out there. Well, now, yeah, there's a potential application here in this passage to that person that, well, there's something wrong with your heart. Mm -hmm. right? But what I'm hearing by far by the people on the Zoom calls and, and all that, the same thing you guys are hearing. Man, we can't wait to get back together. And w when do you think we'll be able to do that? Do the elders have a plan of reentry, you know, with the phases that are coming up and all that? What an encouraging thing it is to hear that from people because they, they want to get back together. So the short answer to all this is that, no, uh, this is not a case of churches, if they're agreeing to submit to the government, which we'll talk about, that they're forsaking the assembly. We are not in sin by doing this as a church. Uh, so for those that believe that, they're just wrong. <laughs> um, and uh, I think we even need to be careful to, to remember that not every place in the world even has the ongoing privileges that we have week after week here that we've, we've grown accustomed to. I mean, there are countries in the world where gathering together is a constant challenge. I mean, they're living with this, maybe have been living with this for decades, if not centuries. Um, yeah, think of, and we can only imagine what believers have to deal with in the hermit kingdom of North Korea. Yeah. I mean, constant, constant threat, constant persecution, and that that's very different circumstances than what we're presently in right now. It ought, to, it ought to be a little bit humbling to us, you know, that we we are so, we think we're so entitled, you know, that, well, you know, we've gone, you know, just a handful of weeks here without being have, able to have our normal Sunday school and our care groups and our meetings and all that kind of stuff. And I'm thinking of believers in places like that that would give anything to have just every once in a while an opportunity, you know, like that. So I think that is important for us to keep in mind that, um, yeah, it puts things in perspective to kind of keep that global mindset. And then even for these weeks, um, the the wealth of resources that we do have readily accessible that we can turn to, you know, the many, many good books in the English language that we can benefit from. Are there any Puritan books like that, you think? Or There's <laughs> many, <laughs> many. The many, you know, sermons that are online that we can listen to, teaching series, and how many ministries out there have been so generous, making things available for free, courses, even, even something, you know, as simple as uh, we have the English, we have the Bible in a translation that we can read, mm. and how many copies of it do we have at home yeah. that... Even putting things in perspective from church history, you have believers that went periods where they didn't even have it in their language. Or if, if they did, um, I'm thinking even of like the, the Waldensians in the, the 1200s. That's what I was thinking of. <laughs> I know. Yeah. yeah, you're stealing Kevin's comment. I know. about the Waldensians. Yeah, you, go ahead. you have uh, this group of believers in Italy and France in the, I think, 1200s and 1300s where... Um, they didn't really have the Bible in their language, or if they did, uh, and and even had it, um, they had portions of it. You know, maybe by by just n not even whole books of the Bible, but maybe a family would be allotted one particular book or a portion of a book. They would take it and commit it to memory. And when they would gather together, they would recite scripture from memory, and that's all that they had. Yeah. And then again, under constant threat of persecution, and so they'd have to scatter, and as they're scattered, all that they had of the Bible was what they had memorized. Yeah. And, and I have before me 
my Bible, the many copies that I have at home, you know, let alone all of us. So when those people were scattering, then they were definitely in sin, violating this verse, forsaking the assembly. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a good illustration. Well, no, that's not the point. Yep. I mean, these people longed for, for that, and they loved the Word of God, and they loved Christ, you know. So again, totally different issue well, what this I, is addressing. I think we'd also have to admit, I mean, some of those people under the direct persecution um, did try to assemble, um, but I, I think maybe it'd be helpful. Do you guys think the situation, is there a nuance, and even in our situation right now, that makes it somewhat different than... Um, in, in than those cases where, um, you know, it was uh, clear hostility yeah. against Christ. Yeah, against as, Christians. Yeah. Um, let, let's go ahead and talk about that. Uh, let's maybe turn to Romans 13 because it brings up the issue of the, of the, of the role of government. While you're doing that, I couldn't help but think of something, I, I think it was Mark Dever that said this recently. On the same subject about uh, he was using the illustration of uh, leper colonies you know those lepers who were being forced to separate from the rest of the of the population because of their disease of course they didn't understand a lot about that disease there was unknown stuff about it does that sound familiar <laughs> there were unknown things about it and so these people were were put away you know and, and you know by either forced or by their own agreement um, I'm trying to think how that happened in the movie Ben Hur, whether it was forced or in agreement. But anyway, uh, that's where we get our theology, right? From those movies like Ben Hur. Love Charlton Heston. <laughs> Charlton Heston. But, uh, you know, it's, I think it was his mother and sister, if I remember right. But, uh, you know, they're down there and, and uh, they were not allowed to be with the rest of the population. You know, they were quarantined. And were those believers who were down there, were they guilty of forsaking the assembly? Should they have said, you know, I'm sorry. But my obligation toward God here is above every other obligation. And so I'm not going to go to this leper colony. In fact, I'm showing up at church on Sunday, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to live out the one another's. You just imagine how would the uh, other believers have, have handled that, you know. I don't think there would have been even some fist bumps uh, with the people, you know. Let alone a holy kiss. Let alone a holy kiss, <laughs> you know. So let's look at uh, Romans 13. Uh, I told you to turn to it, and I didn't. And... Uh, so, uh, Cal, read just uh, 13 verses 1, 2, 3, and through 5. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. He even goes on and talks about, you know, this is fleshed out when you pay your taxes. You know, verse 7, we, we have an obligation to do that. Now, obviously, <laughs> we understand the, the context here. This was written in a time where they had a very godly government, they had uh, leaders that that uh, were moral. Uh, they uh, loved Christ. They loved the church, and they wanted to pass legislation that would always protect God's people. So I, I'm sure it was easier for them. Or, or do I do I misunderstand something here? Am I, <laughs> is there some history that I need to clarify? There is some. What what would that be? Uh, very different from our time. Um, or our time is very different from that time. Um, even coupling with, say, First Peter, where Peter writes similar things, mm-hmm. you know, it's a time where uh, the authority is Nero, and Nero, just a little bit about him, I mean, he, w- he was a madman. He, um, 
history tells us at one point was married and in a fit of rage uh, kicked his pregnant wife, killing her and killing the baby. Uh, later on in his life, he found a young man by the name of Sporus. He had castrated, dressed up to look like this wife, and married her. I mean, a, a very vile, sordid, sordid, immoral man, who then at a certain point began to turn his attention upon Christians and pour out persecution on them, uh, literally even taking people, Christians, and making them human torches to light up the parties that he would have. Hmm. And so, you know, a, a vile, wicked man who then turns persecution against believers, that is so different than what we have today. And yet that's the circumstances in which we hear every believer is to be subject to these authorities. And then even calling these authorities in verse four, they are a minister of God. They've been appointed by God, whoever it might be, whatever party they are in. And it's our responsibility to submit to them. That's an interesting um, thought then that God has ordained government, the concept of government, first of all, and he's ordained the church so we'll talk about where the rub comes. You have two institutions, both ordained by God. Um, so not only the concept of government, but even here and elsewhere in Scripture, the, the idea that even particularly that are in place are there by God's, God's sovereignty in some way or another. You know, uh, Proverbs comes to mind. Even the heart of, of the king is in the Lord's hands. So even even the kind of decisions they make. So yeah, there's the environment, and we're told to submit to government. Now you put all the the passages together about government, you also are able to come up with some sort of understanding of what their purpose is as well. And I think we understand that, well, there's, there's going to be certainly the need for order in society. You know, even, even corrupt countries and nations uh, order of some sort, you know, has a benefit, you know, even in those those countries. So the, the ordering of society is, is one of the benefits here. And one of the purposes here you find for the punishment of evildoers, that's a purpose of government. They take up the sword for that. We, we need to allow them to do that and support their, their call to do that. There's another side of that. And again, I'm kind of a, a broad stroke all over scripture, what the role of government would be. But on the pot, on the negative side, the punishment of evil doers, but on the positive side, really the is the welfare of the people. Uh, there, there is, and I don't mean welfare with a capital W, you know, as far as a, a, a program, but I mean in general, the welfare of people. The government is to be concerned about that. So when the government is expressing, they have a concern about the safety of people. Then we're faced with a choice. I don't like it. It's infringing upon my my lifestyle, or they're servants of God. It's ordained by God, and I need to I need to submit to it. So yeah, uh, even even go back to Genesis. You know where capital punishment is discussed in Genesis nine. It, it's 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 government that has that capability of the death penalty. In the nation of Israel. Uh, it was a na it was a national state, a political nation state. We're not we're not in that today, but uh, there was the right of, of their government within the nation to carry out an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So there's the negative side again, but there's a positive understanding of that. If they're to take life, that's for the purpose of protecting life. You know, at the same time, because the reason they're being punished is that person took a life, and life is important. So government must protect life. So let's think about then what's going on uh, today. Um, the government is, is, has announced restrictions. And the question is, are we to see those as legitimate restrictions? Does it fit the role of government from Scripture that the government would announce restrictions concerning this virus? And the short answer is what? Sure. It's yes. Sure is. <clears throat> Government is fulfilling their role before God of being concerned uh, about what's going on. And so we have an obligation to submit 
to the government. That's a, that's a very important biblical principle, actually, submission to authority all through Scripture. Do you think people really get that, of how important that is to God, submission to authority? It comes out in more than one way, right? Kinds of submissions. Where do we see that in Scripture? What kind of Yeah, I mean, I think, you, obviously, uh, you know, our original panel was going to be the husband and wife relationship, even it's typified there as well. And I think inherent in submission is even sometimes the idea that we don't necessarily one understand the reasons um, why we're being told what we're told, or even we may disagree sometimes with those reasons. And, um, and yet we are called to submit uh, in um, in deference uh, to to authority. I mean, I think in some ways that's inherent even within the idea. Yeah. Um, and and I I mean I think because some people would say, well, what if the government's not carrying out the responsibilities that I think even see in Romans thirteen? What if I don't think they're legitimate in the way they're practicing that? Well, is then do I have to submit to them? Which I think is where we're probably going to go here in a minute with conscientious disobedience and that yeah. whole issue. But I mean, I, I just think of verse five, even here of Romans 13, Paul it isn't necessarily, though he does lay out for us in this section, the role and purpose that God ordained government for. And he says, this is what they're to do. And this is what God has called them to and charged them with. And yet, he doesn't ultimately place the reason for, the ultimate reason for our obedience to them in that necessarily, though it's part of it. In verse 5, he says, it's necessary to be in subjection not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Yeah. Um, and so it surfaces. He, does, he doesn't say, yeah, do this. Now, if you agree, yeah. or if it fits your perspective and your understanding. Yeah. yeah. I think that's hard for people today. I mean, yeah. I think that's well, it's hard, a hard because yeah. of something built into us in the flesh called pride. What you're talking about is a humility that's required on our part toward the government yeah. and the things they're saying they know. I heard one pastor this week call it an intellectual humility. It's a humility we have to exercise toward what they're saying are facts that they have gathered. gathered, gathered. Because the, the tendency is to be, well, I don't know. I'm going to have to gather my own facts. You know? Now, I've watched a couple of videos over here, and I've read a report over here, yeah. and it disagrees with that. You know, So what? I like this one because it agrees with my lifestyle that I want to maintain, so I'm going to go <laughs> with that one. No, there's a humility that's required to say, I'm going to submit my will to the government's will in this, in this restriction. Now you go back to the other, uh, like the husband wife, you brought that up, that's in scripture, authority. Um, children to parents, authority. Uh, slaves to master, authority. We might really kind of see the analogy of an employers to uh, employees to an employer, perhaps, uh, in our culture. It could be an implication there. So all these different kinds of authority all flow out of the fact that we are to submit to God. And what's amazing is even within the Godhead, there is submission and authority, you know, that's demonstrated for us, even though they're equal. That's, that's a hard thing for us to comprehend, you know, the Son submitting to the Father. It is an important principle of submission throughout Scripture. I do wonder sometimes when we as parents don't take it seriously in our own lives, submitting to government, our our comments that we make, our attitudes that we have, and our children are watching that, and yet we're telling them, you need to do what mom and dad say, you know, because we're the authority. Somewhere along the way. And then we wonder when we have issues with our children, yeah. them not respecting authority, whether it's us as parents or them in the classroom, whatever it might be, could it be the example that's set before them day in and day out for mom and dad? Um, isn't this what scripture calls yeah. us to and, and they pick up on that and they see that and it betrays a, a a greater desire within our own hearts to be right <laughs> rather than to cultivate a spiritual fruit of humility and now you're talking about priorities you're talking about being right versus developing some spiritual fruit you said the same thing 
in this passage, it's not about whether I agree or disagree or who's right or right, wrong. It has to do with something higher than for the sake of conscience, really our conscience before God. There are higher principles going on in these kind of situations when we choose to respect the government and honor the government than just our lives and our lifestyle in the economy or anything else. Well, there's another principle or there's another issue that surfaces here, I think, as my mind, you know, has been in the wisdom literature, even through our survey series of the Bible That's and Ecclesiastes nice. and Job, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's as though God everywhere tells us, well, at the end of the day, we don't definitively know what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we don't definitively have um, a our finger on the pulse of what is true and what's not. I think that's particularly challenging in, in the age that we live in, where information is, I mean, and, and we have such access in social media to all this stuff and we can so easily generate our own opinions. And yet I just go back to Ecclesiastes 5 and I just think the wisdom literature warns believers don't, don't, so rashly and quickly speak because you're on earth god is in heaven he mm. knows the full picture uh you know even even the principle from james one slow to speak yeah. uh you you don't know everything and i think oftentimes it is a manifestation sometimes of pride to imagine that we can sit in judgment over what even the governing authorities that God has ordained in our country have decided to do, we may disagree with them, but we have to understand humility would say, that's our opinion. Yeah. And yet, um, you know, Isaiah says, don't, don't, count, don't consult spiritists. In chapter 8 there, he says, don't consult, you know, all the opinions out there Isaiah says to the law and to the testimony. Yeah, and don't 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 uh, don't uh, go to the dead on behalf of the living. You know, yeah. Yeah, it reminds me as well that same mindset of what we ought to have. You know, from Psalm one thirty one. Um, o oh Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty. Yep. Nor do I involve myself in great matters, or in things too difficult for me. And then it goes on, I've composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. And then he says, oh, Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. I mean, what's going on right now? Again, with, with the bombardment of facts and new information here and new symptoms there, trying to figure out medically, you know, is there a way that we can flatten the curve and hopefully a vaccine can be developed? I mean, with all of that, I and, and any one of us, let alone how many countless people, these are great matters and these are things too difficult for us. We, we're not the experts. Yeah, the temptation is to feel like the experts with all the information at our fingertips, to, yeah. to be sitting at our computers and, and just to, to imagine, man, I, I have some insight here. Yeah. And, and, and that principle is so helpful because... Yeah, the I, end went, of the day. I went on YouTube. I, yeah. I've watched a video. Yeah. I was at Holiday Inn Express last night, <laughs> and I looked at Facebook, and I watched these three videos. No, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, Job picks up that very phrase, things do too wonderful for me. When God comes out of the whirlwind and says, you answer me, who's darkened, you know, my presence with words without knowledge? Who's darkened my... And, you know, it's, and they just, you know, the section. And it is that we must... I think remember that we have to approach life that way because ultimately that is where wisdom begins yeah. is well, in a fear of the Lord and recognizing hmm. that we cannot declare it as in the language of Isaiah. I was telling Kyle earlier, you're only as your theology is only as deep as the last book you studied. Mine is Isaiah, so my mind is there. It's very deep. I mean, wow. that's so, a great book. So, <laughs> no, I mean, I don't mean that for you, um, but uh, you know how it is. Um, but just, just even in the book of Isaiah, God is challenging his own people and then calling the nations to come and 
and compete with him in chapters 40 through 48 there where he says, and one of those, you know, tests of true deity, you know, who is like me? One of those tests is not only declaring the future and things to come, but also I found this fascinating declaring things in the past. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, why is that a test? Well, ultimately the Lord is saying, who can, who can ultimately definitively say what, what even this past event means or has meant, you know, like mm -hmm. who has the final evaluation or say on even the events that you can see what's ultimately behind them. Mm -hmm. And and his point is only God can yeah. make that final judgment. And that that's what prompts the humility yeah. right there is yeah. understanding that. Yeah. And in, 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 in the cultivation of humility, I think a, a pastoral admonition to one another and to our church family too, as an overarching principle of the last few minutes of our discussion would be where, where and where, where do our greatest energies lie when it comes to the cultivation of knowledge? Mm -hmm. Are we seeking to, through God's word, understand our God? Or are we spending more time on social media, the internet? I got to figure out this virus. Yeah, trying to figure out the virus. And when, when we put those things together, are we pursuing earthly wisdom or are we pursuing things that are above? And when we pursue earthly wisdom, as, as James says, worldly wisdom, that's actually what's going to begin to cause division within God's people because we all have opinions about all these earthly things. And that's our passions at war because I want to be right, as we talked about, versus, you know, I want to be humble. And, and speaking of creating and cultivating humility, nothing will do that more than being in God's word and seeking to understand God because the deeper we go, the more we realize we do not understand. And those earthly things begin to fade away and we cultivate a hunger and thirst yeah. for the knowledge of God. Good. Now, with all that said, uh, we do that. But we pursue the word. We pursue truth, truth. We pursue walking with Christ as our priority. We submit to government. And yet the very word that we're saying that we're going to study also says there's a place for drawing a line sometime. Uh, Acts chapter 5 is kind of the classic verse we go to, right? Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Let's look at that and talk about just for a few minutes about where do we draw the line and, and actually exercise what some call is civil disobedience, standing up against the government, saying no to the government. Is there ever a place for that? And the short answer to that, yes, is yes, there there is a place for that. Um, Danny, read Acts 5, 29. Sure. Acts 529, uh, Peter, in response to the leaders of the day, he said, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. Yeah, so there is a place, and again, you alluded to the context that they had been told to stop preaching <laughs> and truth. And so he says very clearly, we must obey God rather than man. This is another one of those verses, like forsake not the assembly. <laughs> Just pull that thing out and use yeah. it for whatever yeah. you want. You yeah. know? But, okay, you gotta be you got to be careful with it. Yes, so there is a place, but there's a, there's a, a, a huge necessity uh, for um, a huge burden, you could say, for proof that what is happening has brought us to the place that is necessary to obey Scripture. And I'm trying to say that with really as much verbiage as possible to make the point, even with that choice of verbiage, that it's a complicated issue. It's not something you just rush into. I don't like what's going on, so I need to obey. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, Acts 5.29. It's my life verse. It's on my refrigerator. Yeah, I just think of like my child saying that to me when I give them a command. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> Dad... This is I, like, especially even a command that's not in scripture, yeah. eat your food. It's like, um, yeah, I must obey God and not man. It's just, it's that kind <laughs> yeah. of, it, there, there is a misapplication. In other words, that you're pointing to, we can't flatten it out like that. There's more nuance to it because in what Peter's in the context of what Peter is saying, the, the, the leaders have explicitly commanded them to not do something that they explicitly know from God's word, they cannot um, obey. Yeah. And so in that sense, you know, there's, that's, it's not just, 
any word from men I can throw off because I and God is my excuse. You know, yeah. that's not what he's saying. Here. Yeah, it's sort of like an analogy of uh, people who make their decisions and defend them by saying, well, God spoke to me. You know, so what do you do with that? Uh, it's, it's using a, a concept that's really uh, not valid. Well, this means something practical in a, in a, in a time like this with the coronavirus and what the, in, in the, what the government is telling us, the restrictions they're putting on the church. Uh, we, we can't just flippantly take some anecdotal evidence. When I say a high, a necessity for a high level of proof that's necessary to drive us to disobey government, it's not anecdotal evidence. It's not some video on YouTube. It's not hearsay. It's not the conspiracy theories that are going to float around all the time on a lot of different subjects. I mean, I do believe Elvis is still alive. That's a different issue, okay, because wow. that's not a concern. <laughs> no, that's the category of stuff we talk about. He's hanging really. out with Bigfoot right now. And Bigfoot, you know, there's a category of stuff that tends to become the world's six feet hide and seek champion. Well, of course there are conspiracies going on all the time. Of course government's corrupt, I mean, many times. All oh, that's true, but we, 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 for us, it has to, has to mean that we, we humbly say we don't have all the information that's needed. We humbly say we can't just trust everybody else's opinion out there at any given moment. We have got uh, to be careful in, in, in taking the position that, well, listen, you know, hey, I've talked to a couple of people. I think this whole thing's blown out of proportion. I mean, this is just crazy, you know, what's going on right now. You know, this is, this is, this is crossed the line for me. Well, based upon what? what? What evidence do you have? What real proof do you have? What hard evidence is there? Are we being careful to not even fall prey to the ad hominem arguments? That comes up in times like this where people start being attacked, you know, whether it's a particular government leader or a, a scientist or a CDC person or a doctor locally or whatever, just start attacking them, something we don't like about them, as if that's the same thing as having hard evidence about a virus. No, it's not. So yes, we have to be very, very careful, but there are, there are uh, really issues that we have to look at and prioritize them when the government says certain things, okay? There, there are things that the government could tell us to do that go against what God says, and there are things the government could forbid that yet God clearly commands. We understand that. Yeah, and just like the your discussion, just to bring it full circle back to the beginning about Hebrews 10 and what it really means, I mean, this is where it gets complicated because sometimes we have a hard time discerning when, when that is. You know, for a number of factors, we might confuse the stepping of, the stepping all over of our constitutional rights, which is in one sense an abuse, Mm -hmm. But it is it isn't it abuse is it an abuse of Acts five proportions that that allow us to then say what Peter says and I think that is where sometimes the confusion arises. Would you say? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, there's a difference between our clear cut biblical obligations that we are hills to die on. Let's just put it in those those um, colloquial terms versus uh, some issues that are less important in the whole scheme of things uh, that the government might impose upon us. We are going to say that some things, we just need to see them where they really are in the pecking order and say that, you know what, on this, this is not an issue that I am compelled to disobey the government and suffer the consequences for it. I mean, you get into that kind of language that there are places for obeying God rather than man and then being willing to suffer the consequences for it. Well, depending on what the government tells me to do, they enact a law that says absolutely, you know, churches can't meet on Sundays. They can only meet on Saturdays. Well, you kind of have to weigh that. Am I willing to go to jail over that one? I, I'm just speaking to me personally. Probably not. I'm going to meet on another day, you know, which... Um, fulfills my obligation to the Lord. Uh, if, if, uh, if the government uh, says, here are certain things you can do as parents and here are certain things you cannot. Well, I'm going to have to to weigh that in the scheme of parenting. You know, Am I willing to go to jail and suffer imprisonment over this issue? Not necessarily. 
And so I think there's a pecking order of priorities, and I think there has to be hard evidence that's going to compel us to the place of going, okay, I'm now uh, so restricted that I'm being made to compromise my love for Christ and my love for truth in some way, and that I cannot do. And when you get to those things, I have to say, then yes, I'm willing to suffer the consequences for that disobedience. Yeah, and even just reminding all of us in North Carolina, what what has been mandated and enacted isn't solely singling out and discriminating against Christians and churches. Yeah, and this is this is everyone's affected, and even there, it's it's different than a circumstance like in Acts five where singling out believers you cannot preach christ and if it comes to that well yeah we must obey god rather than men we will preach christ but then be willing to suffer the consequences and as we do that you know peacefully graciously but not stirring up some anarchist scene yeah, you know and frankly that's not the same issue as saying you know what this inconsistency on the part of the government, I, I'm, I'm not going along with it anymore. You know, they're, they're letting this business be open, but not Walmart. Or they're doing this one, but not this business. You know, that inconsistency, I must obey God rather than man. Okay, that, that's not really the point there. So, yes, we've got to be driven to the point of saying that um, it's so crossed a line that there are there's no other way I can continue to do this without violating my conscience before the Lord. Until that line comes, then our church's decision in this time of COVID is we are going to defer to the government as long as we possibly can. That's what we're going to do. So yeah. people ask me, well, what do you mean by that? Well, it could be another three months. It could be a six months. It could be a year. And my answer is it could be. Yeah, I mean, the, gov the, gov the government is, and let's be clear, the government is going to be inconsistent. Yeah. The government is going to be unjust. There are going to be abuses at times, you know, and, and it's not so much that we are um, denying that, you know, it, but it, it's... Nor saying uh, it's a perfect government. Yeah, again, it's not the reason why we obey them at the end of the day. That's That's what we're saying, right? We submit to them because we submit to the Lord. And I think one of the principles that we're bringing out here, even in our obedience to the Lord and to his scriptures and working these principles through in our own circumstances with wisdom and nuance, um, my mind goes to um, Mark chapter 2, where you guys remember, you know, when Jesus is saying, you know, of course, we're not Sabbatarian, but the principle remains. Jesus is saying, even to the religious leaders there, um, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. You remember? And then he, the example that he brings up in, in I think it is uh, David. David. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, when, when he, and he explicitly says, David, when he was on the run, there was a season and circumstance in which he did something that was explicitly forbidden by God's law. And that is taking from the consecrated bread and giving it to his men to eat bread that only priests could partake of. And it's like, and so even though that, it just, all of that just simply to say, there is there is a sense in which we have to, with wisdom, apply these biblical principles to our current circumstances. I would say, for us, the, the similarity is that we are in a unique season, like David was in that sense, on the run, uniquely so, and it was okay for him to do that, mm -hmm. though it was expressly forbidden by the Lord in normal circumstances. Yeah. And so you know, perhaps it's helpful to consider it even like that. And I think what's always needs to be on the forefront, especially of the pastors and elders given the charge to, to shepherd the flock and we're, we're responsible for the souls of the flock to know that we will stand in judgment before God as to how we have shepherded our people through this particular circumstance and obviously throughout the, the tenor of our shepherding, but this will be a, a, a unique time in the life of shepherds where they will stand before God and answer. And we need to be fully convinced in our own mind, in our study of the scriptures and our consciences before God that we can stand and say the decision that we made, we believe was what was best for our people, what 
honored the Lord, what followed the scriptural principles of submission to government. And that, that is something that we are in constant conversation about amongst the staff, amongst the, the elders. Um, and, and the uniqueness of the situation is week to week it changes mm-hmm. in these different phases. What do we do with this next phase? But again, I, it comes back to even that moment where we, we, are, we have been placed in this particular time frame to shepherd our people, and, and, and we need to be fully convinced that when we stand before God, we can answer for each one of our decisions. Yeah, that, that brings up this too. I think as elders, uh, the question comes up, um, well, then what if this continues? Okay, what if the government lingers this out? What if they even take a step backward and say, well, this has spread more than we anticipated and now we're gonna to have to have these restrictions again. Our attitude is then we're, we're gonna still defer as long as possible. We're gonna keep finding other ways to, uh, to minister. Um, I think a, a perspective that we keep in mind along with that is how easy the idea of rights Across, you know, uh, control people. You know, you mentioned this earlier. We might have a constitutional right to something. Yep. That's not the same thing as, as scripture and yep. as the Bible. The Constitution, even of our own country, as wonderful as it is, it's not the final authority on anything. So those rights might be violated. We we might lose some rights, but that's where idolatry comes in. It's how easy we make idols out of things that we care about so much, even things like freedom. Yeah. We make an idol out of freedom, and we've gotten very accustomed to that here in the West, in America. We're very independence-minded. You can make an idol out of independence. You can make an idol out of comfort. You can make an idol out of how we normally do things as a church. I mean, if it got bad enough, if the world really got serious enough, we might, too, as a church, have to take a step back and restructure everything we do. And it yeah. may never be the same as it was. Well, have we made an idol of the past? in the things we've enjoyed? Have we made an idol out of doing what we want to do because that's the way it is for in America? We, 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 we get what we want. We've gotta be careful about that. Again, that's the other side of that is pride. I don't like people telling me what to do. Yeah, and, and in the midst of that too, with what has taken place in the last several weeks, I mean, just like that, many of the things that Americans and even Christians in America can be tempted to look to for security or satisfaction, which if you take that a little further, could become an idol. Mm-hmm. You know, our our wealth and our securities there, our entertainment and sports or or you know, traveling, whatever it might be, the, the American dream, just like that, Those has been put on hold yeah. and paused. And maybe for some of us right now, us not liking what's going on is because the idol that we've been clinging to, God has removed that. And if that has happened, that's then to draw us to look back to him for security and for satisfaction. Yeah, you wonder <laughs> what, what is what are God's, God's purposes for allowing this to go on right now. That's got to be one of those reasons because he always wants that from his people, what you described right there. And the fear, the, 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 the other issue is that then we, we quickly replace those other idols with other idols well, look, <laughs> other than gonna, God. We're going to figure this thing out yes. and come up with new yes. ways to do things and yes. new idols. That's yeah. so, it's like Calvin said, the human heart is a factory of idols. You know? Yeah, I was starting to call earlier, you know, there, there is um, a fear when those idols are being tampered with. And I think it's helpful even to recognize that at the core of two different responses to this thing um, is this idolatry of this life yeah. and this fear because there are some on opposite ends of the spectrum. There is one end that says uh, is, is captured in the person who's just so fearful of getting the virus, holding, holding themselves up, washing their hands every 10 seconds, and then there may be on this other side people who despise that and say, no, we need to open up. We need to just get out there. But, the, but, but fear is still behind that because while one is fearing for his health and his life, the other is fearing the economy is going to crash. Both have, yeah. both have sort of the same problem behind them, though they look even perhaps politically on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Fear is still driving them and it's still 
a worldly mindset. It's very interesting, you know, that you could have a fear of not getting my lifestyle back. Yeah. Uh, that is a fear. Well, we as elders, I mean, we, we're weighing all of this, and we are, our attitude is we're going to defer as long as possible because we take those principles about submission and humility seriously. So, again, asking the question, what, what, what if it, it lingers so much that we start getting also over time um, truly believing that something is amiss. I mean, something is amiss here. It's starting to cross a line. It, 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 you know, it, it, it's time that we as elders take another look at this. We talked about this last night in our elder meeting a little bit, that, well, we as elders would do that. We're doing it anyway. We're praying about it. We're discussing it. We would continue to do that. And if it ever came to that place that now it's time, that we're going to have to stand up and make a different decision because we're driven by conscience on it. You know, we take comfort in the fact that we'll, we're going to be unified in that. It's not just one of us going, you know what, I'm sorry. The rest of you guys, I've, I've watched yeah. the video, and this is I, I just think this is all blown out of proportion. No, we're going, to, we're going to pray. We're going to come to that unified, and we're going to be making that decision, even if it meant to disobey the government, which means we also have in unity made the decision we're willing to suffer the consequences. Yeah. I am telling you, we're not there right now yeah. as, as elders. <laughs> we're not saying this is it. We're willing to go to jail and we're going to start meeting. And I'm just telling you, I'm not willing to go to jail just yet <laughs> uh, over this coronavirus. You know, yeah, it's, it's not there. It's just such a, it just proves how, how much of a challenge it is and it's never clear cut, you know, and I think at the end of the day, it should also be said as your elders, you know, as, as the elders are wrestling with this, at the, at the end of the day, the sheep, um, we hope that our people would trust us in that, in those decisions. And we have to be careful. We're trying to be as careful as we can and um, with our own consciences and then also with the decisions we make that we know impact our sheep. But... Mm -hmm. I think one an illustration even in church history that proves that it is such it's just so hard even um, in the English Reformation when to decide to break from you know a state church and when not to and just even good men on wrestling with those issues mm -hmm. and trying to make those decisions and thinking through you know as we look back just how hard that was. Uh, and it's obviously a different situation, different issues, but mm -hmm. same principle. Same principles, you know, yeah. for us, and just a perhaps a friendly reminder for our people and for us as well as elders, you know, as we even defer to one another and talk through the issues and realize that we're all going to hold strong opinions, sometimes even politically, and land here and land there, but. Um, we're called to, uh, you know, still to preserve this unity in all of it. Yeah, that, that bridges into really the last thing I want to I say here this morning, just real quickly. And then we're going to give some quick bullet points, summary words and thoughts that just summarize all this as implications. But it, it, it's our, our testimony to the world in this as being so much more important than our personal opinions and whether our lifestyles have been affected. And along with our testimony to the world, uh, companion thought to that is being careful that we have the testimony of loving our neighbors during this time. That's a little bit of a concern when you, when you see and hear about churches that are saying, I don't care what the government says, I don't care what the people in the neighborhood say. Hey, you know, we're going to obey God rather than man, you know, using that verse out of context, and we're going to meet anyway. And, and yet, and then, then unbelievers looking at that, it's one thing that they don't understand our theology, but it's another thing when they don't understand our callousness and our lack of care for, for people who, who could be impacted by this in a negative way and hurting and even dying. You know, it's easy for people when they haven't had a loved one infected or they haven't been working in the, the, the ICU and seen one, see someone die from this on a respirator, it's, it's real easy to be insulated and say, this is all just overblown and I don't care what anybody else thinks. But I, th this is a real issue. We have to be concerned about our testimony of, of not wanting the community to view us as being belligerent yeah. fighters. Yeah. 
and just defying the stay-at-home orders because uh, we just don't care what the government uh, says, especially when the when the population is looking at it. Well, you guys get in there and you're not only coughing on one another, but I heard I heard someone say that this week. But you're singing. Singing is like is one of the most easy ways to spread all this, you know, because of how hard we we push out the particles in our lungs and everything else. So you're all getting in there, hugging one another with holy kisses and shaking hands and singing and spreading the virus everywhere. And then they're going out in their community thinking they're okay and, and they really don't care about us. So, I mean, that's a little bit of, a, of an extreme way to state, state it. But the principle for me comes from 1 Peter 3, uh, verse 15, where in the context of evangelism to the world, we're told in 1 Peter 3, 15, that we're not only to make sure that we've sanctified Christ as Lord in our hearts, that we're absolutely committed to Him, to the Lordship of Christ, even in practical ways in our lives. But at the same time, uh, and being ready to give a defense, uh, but to do it with gentleness and reverence as we talk to people, but verse 16, and keeping a good conscience. So that in the things in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ would be put to shame. Another way to summarize that is that the world can't, with validity, look at us and, and, and see a lack of integrity and see a lack of love and see a lack of, a lack of consistency, that they really have something that they can grab hold of that, that's wrong about us. You know? yeah. We have to be concerned about that. Yeah, it's let, let's let the gospel be the stumbling block and not our belligerence. belligerence. Yeah or whatever character. Well, along with that, not just overt belligerence, but what about something more subtle? How does grumbling and complaining fit into this? Does it apply? Oh, yeah. How? What's so bad about that? Uh, I mean... I like grumbling. There's a temptation. <laughs> it feels good, actually. Yeah, it's, it's quite natural. Could be quite natural, except in God's eyes, it's, it's so very serious. And I think it's become... I mean, I was mentioning this to the other men um and not that i'm immune from it i have to guard my own heart constantly mm -hmm. or and even in the last few weeks there have been some moments and times even at home with my family that i've had to seek forgiveness for my grumbling and complaining spirit and i've had to repent from that why because in god's eyes it's sin it does not please him and to be grumbling and complaining so quickly uh, hurts our testimony and how easy it is to just grumble and complain and vent on social media or at home with the children to vent and to just carry ourselves in such a... Those uh, are still uh, working out there with employees, uh, fellow employees, co-workers, <laughs> venting about the government, venting about, you know, we, we see the inconsistencies, venting about the, the lack of trust, a, a particular individual we don't like. Uh, yeah, all that ends up being a damage to our testimony. It is because it it's it's so, you know, moment by moment, um, grumbling and complaining is maybe amongst others and, and around those near us, and yet it is calling into question God's sovereignty, God's wisdom, and God's goodness. And if we want to be reminded of how serious it is, look at the people of Israel as they grumble and as they complain in the midst of God's gracious, kind provision for them, ultimately, um, that's one of the key things that prohibits them from entering the promised land, mm -hmm. which then going into the book of Hebrews is symptomatic of this evil, wicked, unbelieving heart. Mm -hmm. So let all of us, myself and all of us and anyone watching, again, be reminded, God views that as something very serious, very sinful. It so withers and dries up spirituality. And, and you know, it can be not expressed in so many little things. Uh, you know, the government's saying uh, our, our desire is that you'd, you'd wear masks when you go into the grocery store or whatever. And it's the, I'm not going to do that. I look stupid in it. I don't see the point in it. And uh, I don't like the government telling me what to do. Well, sometimes it's just for the sake of conscience. It's for the sake of testimony. It's it's for the sake of love for your brother. Yeah, it's, it's don't die on those hills. Yeah, Philippians too. It's considering others more important than myself. Yeah, it's not just looking out for my own interests, but looking out and considering the interests of others. Yeah, speaking of Philippians too, I mean the prohibition there in against grumbling and complaining is yeah. tied directly so that you'll be blameless 
uh, and innocent uh, as, you know, uh, I forget the language there, but holding forth a word of mm -hmm. life, um, you know, as stars, I think. Uh, yeah. It, it is yeah. tied to your testimony in a crooked yeah. and perverse generation. It is. Yeah. When we grumble and complain, we are not making God and the gospel look great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good, good way to say that. All right, here are the here are the bullet point implications here at the end. We've uh, we've gone uh, 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 as long as we, we 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 can on this, but trying to keep it uh, uh, to uh, under three hours. Uh, uh, yeah, under three hours. Not Lord of the Rings yeah. extended so, edition. Uh, <laughs> here are the implications from my perspective. Post production, start, we can put an in intermission or something. There we go. Uh, start with this. Pray. Okay, what, what should our response be during this time instead of grumbling and blaming? Well, let's start prayer, of course. Prayer that the government will have wisdom. Prayer that God would overturn their decisions for his purposes. Prayer for our protection. Prayer for our testimony. Pray that, uh, that this would end. I mean, it's, in all this that we're saying, it's not that we don't want those freedoms back. Uh, I, I, wanna, I want those again, of course. So let's pray. Um, second, Remember the importance of, 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 our, of, our, of our voting that we do when there are elections. And I, I throw that in here just from this standpoint. In a crisis like this, we are going to need to defer to the government. We certainly don't want people in there that are Nero's. We don't want people there that have other agendas that they are going to seize on things like this to persecute Christians and to uh, bring pressure upon the church. If that's their bent because of their worldview, well, don't set them up, you know, for being tempted in a time like this to live out those evil worldviews, you know. So we do have to take that seriously. It's a big responsibility we have to vote according to our worldview and try to put people in place that even if they're unbelievers, that they'll try to think wisely about their roles, about protecting people, the welfare of the people, and punishment of evildoers. Those are biblical concepts. So we must remember that as well. Third, and this has come out in what we've said, is we need to be careful to express our opinions and our desires and our perspectives graciously to people so that uh, we preserve the unity of the church. Be careful how you express it to other people in the body so that it's not a divisive thing over politics and who they voted for and who they didn't vote for and whether they like this government leader or don't like it or whether they agree with the restrictions or don't agree with the restrictions. It's not worth dividing the body over that. Be careful how you speak to one another about your, your convictions and your preferences. And if, if you speak to government officials about it, be gracious in how you do that as well. That's a privilege we have. It's a freedom we have to express our desires, write them a letter, whatever. But do it in a way that honors God in our testimony. So remember that. Trust in God. That, that's an implication of all this. We must trust God. You brought up the issue of even trusting how God is working through the government and working through the elders, our decisions, even if we're wrong. It doesn't affect God's sovereignty. It doesn't thwart his will, according to Scripture. Trust God. Instead of grumbling and complaining, the opposite of that is be grateful. To be grateful for the freedoms we've had as, as Americans and, and we hope to still have. Be grateful for the blessings we've had. And if they're taken away from us forever, be grateful that we had them for a time. Uh, gratitude really is uh, one way to say the cure for a grumbling and complaining heart. During this time, be intentional in ministry and in worship. Be intentional as you can. And a word to the dads, be intentional in worship. You know, dads, you carry the responsibility of assembling your family to watch the live stream. Don't, don't treat that as something that's not important, that we can take it or leave it. No, uh, heighten the awareness of it with your family. No, we're going to we're going to do this together as a family, if at all possible. So be intentional in ministry. You said that last time about love, contacting one another, calling one another, reaching out to one another. Be humble and willing to defer, even in the little things like wearing a mask or even in the other little things that come up. Be humble and just willing to defer. And lastly, for me, it summarizes some of this, be more concerned about your testimony than your rights and your opinions. There, there are things more important, and certainly our testimony of love for God and making God big and great in the eyes of people is, is more important. So those were just some final bullet points for me. I don't know if I missed one, but would summarize something we said? Yeah, I think I just overall just um, 
you know, are being being focused on what God is doing. I mean, at the end of the day, as opposed to some other sort of my, my you know, the details of things. I just think of Paul, I mean, it, being imprisoned even unjustly for the gospel, and yet in Philippians 1.12 saying, I want you to know that my circumstances have rather turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. He would never have been attuned to that. Yeah. Had he been only focused on his own rights mm-hmm. um, as a Roman citizen, you know, and to see that what has come of it, well, some letters of scripture. Uh, I mean, just <laughs> that's good. I, yeah, that's great. Just a few. Uh, just a few. I mean, I just think there is, in that sense, such an example to us given. Um, you know, even in his life and in the in the account given to us in Acts, even as even loving your neighbor in the midst of being hauled to Rome, you know, you think of Acts twenty seven, he's shipwrecked there, and his concern is for the lives of those people, the pagans who are taking him there, <laughs> yeah. and uh, just fascinating. I mean, um, to yeah. think through, but all all of that to say, we would miss that if our perspective weren't. Um, bigger mm-hmm. and trusting God looking and waiting upon him to see what he's doing mm-hmm. so that we can jump in and seize those opportunities mm-hmm. uh, we would otherwise miss that if we were looking for uh, conspiracies as to how to fix the economy or mm-hmm. whatever it might be okay. well let's uh, pray for all these things I'll lead us in prayer as we close um, yeah, so we look forward to what the Lord's going to do next, and we certainly, our hope is that we can uh, gather again as quickly as we can. For those of you who are part of Twin City, our elders uh, have put together a, and are trying to finish uh, the plan of what that would look like for us as a church as phase one uh, starts at the end of May. Uh, we're targeting uh, May 24th as the first <laughs> Sunday of, of some level of gathering again, and so we'll see if the Lord... Uh, As James says, if the Lord wills, (laughs) we'll do that. And if not, we'll be grateful for whatever he has uh, for us. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for this time of discussion. And I know that um, there's certainly more that can be said and more issues that we can address. But I pray that you would would take anything that we've shared today that is true and biblical and use it in the hearts of people, in our own hearts as well, as we go forth to try to live during this unique time of of quarantine and and concern over virus and infection and everything else that we would be able to live in such a way that we would be lights in this perverse world amongst a perverse generation, that we would keep our priorities in order of what's most important, that we would uh, be caring about uh, our spiritual growth as individuals and our testimony about Christ to others, caring about those things more than anything else. Lord, we want to be wise, and we certainly want a solution to come. It is our, our prayer that you would guide those in authority to, to bring about the kinds of decisions that would, uh, would promote us being together again. That's our heart's desire, and so we ask you for that. But we are grateful, Lord, for every privilege we've ever enjoyed, even if we never have them again, every freedom we've ever enjoyed. That Lord, we're grateful for those. We did not deserve them. Ultimately, it was not a right. It was a privilege and a blessing from a good God, so we thank you for them. But as we go forward, help us to be willing to trust you so that we don't fear and to accept, embrace whatever your will is for us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thanks again for being with us.